Can you get the bug on camera? Can we get him <laughs> bucking on camera? There he is. Can we get a little buck, buddy? Him? Give a little buck. Oh, oh, oh what do he it. wants to. He's oh, doing. He's do thrown it. by he's the sliding. angle. Do it. <laughs> what is that thing? <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. I'm Corey. I'm Jen. I'm Natalie. I'm Ginny. And we are the Art History Babes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're together <laughs> in Zoom land once again for you yes. all. Yeah. In the Zoom here on the internet. It's, it's where I'm we... sorry because I'm watching this bug. <laughs> on the table and it's it's rearing up like it'll crawl a few steps and then it'll rear up like a, like a like little, a little horsey. bronco <laughs> but it's oh. like blucifer yes oh. <laughs> blucifer can you take a picture of this bug immediately yeah and um I'm- show us because yeah. i want to see this bug yeah. yeah gotta see the bug can you get the bug I- on camera can we get him <laughs> bucking on camera? There he is. He's, Can we get a little buck, him? buddy? Give a little buck. Oh, oh, oh what do he it. wants to? He's oh, doing. He's do thrown it. by he's the sliding. angle. Do it. <laughs> what is that thing? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Their newest mascot. <laughs> that reminds oh, me of like it used to be a real thing. The like um, the flea circuses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, he's doing it. <laughs> I yeah. see him doing it. Yeah. yeah, like the little yeah. insect circuses. That was like a real thing. That was like a real attraction that people wow. did and, and, and paid money to see. Podcast see- episode? <laughs> Bug circus? <Yes. laughs> do, y'all, that- do y'all remember um, being like stoked as hell on Mexican jumping beans yep. as a kid? And then the horror of learning mm-hmm. that it's because there's like larva inside? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Our mm-hmm. parents should have never let us bring that shit home. <laughs> no. It's fucking gross. <laughs> Bugs, man. I, oh I my feel God. like that's something so, I don't know, so human, so primal, so instinctual. We've always just been interested in bugs like we've always just been <laughs> kind of like these little you know these these weird little guys like they they grab our attention for sure yeah bugs and rocks i feel like are the childhood obsessions mm. that totally stick around for a lot of people bugs never, and never away. rocks bugs and rocks um new side project check it out on only fans <laughs> Um, us playing with bugs and rocks. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm trying to figure out a good way to segue. I feel like bugs and rocks. You bugs, put that together, and bugs, it kind of it kind of sounds like baroque. Baroque <laughs> bugs yeah. and rocks. Baroque bugs and rocks. Bugs, rocks baroque. Baroque, Barack, Barack Obama. (laughs) We got there. Yeah, we got there. Yep, beautiful. (laughs) The English language. Um, today we're doing a fun homage to our very first podcast episode. You guys. Oh my God! It was the first one. It was the first one. It was. It was nostalgia. It was indeed. Man, oh man, I spent so much time uh, on the shitty like uh, Mac like photo editor, like cutting all of our faces onto oh, yeah. that one Caravaggio painting. Yep, mm-hmm. that was really fun. Um, <laughs> Will you do was- a new one for this, Jen? I'll send you. I already know what image I think we should use. Oh yeah, you should send it for sure, and I will. I'll get on it. I'll, I'll lose sleep over it because that's what I did last time. I was like, I got to do this. I <laughs> yeah, just recently like- sent that to someone. So it's still as relevant today as it was. then. <laughs> yes. That was like prime grad school, too. I remember that. Were we TAs together and design that? Uh, yeah, that first- that quarter, I think Yeah, we were. And, and- I, I feel like I, re- I, I don't know how much of this is a constructed memory and how much is a real memory, but I feel like I remember you like coming in to that class and being like, I, I was up all night, like making this. <laughs> yeah, I was. 
<laughs> it was, you know, I mean, I think we had a seminar paper due. I took an Adderall. I drank a bottle of wine. I didn't write any of the paper. I made this amazing piece of art instead. So, I love it. That's yeah. that, that was beautiful. grad school. That was. <laughs> it was like productive procrastination. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> that's what the podcast not doing was. other things, but it's not like we were just sitting around. We would do other things with manic intensity. <laughs> and again, <laughs> reminder <laughs> that Photoshop picture still relevant, still coming up. The essay? See? I don't know if it would be. Seminar yeah, essays? I don't, I don't show about. people those. Yeah, those no, they're pretty much that's... gone to the ether at this point. So, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, that was our first episode. We talked about the bad boys of the Baroque. And today we're going to talk about the bad bitches of the mm-hmm. Baroque. Because mm-hmm. I mean, is that cool? Is that woke? Are we like, you know, we can call probably it not, it, but right? we can say whatever we want. It's our podcast. No, like, <laughs> 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 of endearment, we decide what it means. I like I, it. I think I think uh, it depends on who you ask. Some people not a big fan of that term. Other people use it far and wide. And it's just it is what it is. I'm Don't very speak, comfortable ben. with the term. Yeah, I'm, I'm cool. With, I'm cool with it. And I like, um, I like binge binches. That's fun. That's, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's hard to say. Yeah, I also feel like it's it's definitely in a positive connotation because it's yeah. bad bitches. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm a the bad. That is really important. Like, that's. Yeah, the bad the bad part yeah. is really important. Yeah. yeah. Right. Otherwise it's just <laughs> bitches. Right. The bitches. bitches is baroque. Baroque. <laughs> Honestly, that would be a great. It would just be a very different episode. I we could know. rename yeah. bad boys of the baroque, the bitches of the baroque, and that would like I just possibly like yeah. Fit. I just like bitches of the baroque. That's hilarious. <laughs> the language is incredible. It is. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah, so First episode, very, very first episode of this podcast way back in 2016. We were just little, little baby podcasters. Um, Also, yeah, within the context of the insanity of grad school. And we put together our first episode, Bad Boys of the Broke, in which we um, we talked about three big name male artists in the Baroque period, all of which had complicated stories attached to them. So for this podcast, we're going to follow that that same outline. We've picked three just badass ladies that were Baroque artists to talk about to give you a little very brief understanding of what Baroque means if you are unfamiliar or if you just need a refresher. One, you can always go to the bad boys of the broke episode which i will be rebooting alongside this episode so it should be pretty easy for you to find (laughs) um it'll also be linked in places but um quick rundown of what the baroque style even is it is the name given to an artistic style that arose roughly 1600 era in rome um, it is also a term often used for music, like the, a musical style as well. I think we've talked about this a little bit before. You hear it a lot, actually, in relation to music. And there are yeah. a lot of similarities, like there's crossover in what Baroque means in music and what it means in art. However, they are still different things. Some key aspects of the Baroque, I guess you could say. Uh, drama, lots of drama in Baroque art often a lot of like contrast, darks and lights, a lot of tension. So the word itself, Baroque, derives from the Portuguese and Spanish word for large, irregularly shaped pearl. And Baroque, just like so many other terms we use to describe art styles, was originally a term that didn't have good connotation. It was... It was kind of meant as a a stab like Mm -hmm. um, and and this kind of comes from the fact that like a regularly shaped pearl was a dig because a lot of these critics preferred like neoclassicism and very like clean lines and, and things like that. And Baroque was undulating and there was curves and it was intense and it seemed very bizarre to a lot of people. So that's Mm -hmm. where this like misshapen 
pearl concept comes from. Historically speaking, the style arose from like counter-reformation sentiments. A lot of Baroque art that we automatically go to is is very Catholic and Mm -hmm. and very emotional. Like the Vatican is full of the stuff. And this has to do with the fact that Protestant thinking was was very critical of images um, and, and Catholics loved them. So they basically doubled down with the Baroque post Protestant Reformation. Right. Um, however, as we will talk about in this episode, I'm sure we start to see more variation when Baroque moves north to more Protestant dominated countries, um, mm-hmm. two of which I know we're talking about today. Um, a few, a few artists that my, my colleagues will discuss. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Man, we use this, right? use that term more. I know. It's good. The colleagues. It reminds me of there's um, the episode of Parks and Rec. Uh, f- for some reason, Andy is talking about like a pack of raccoons, and he refers to them as his friends, and then he's like, "Oh no, that sounds stupid." Colleagues. <laughs> 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 I Andy Dwyer, it. what a what a character! Classic, classic. Um, yeah. So, uh, Baroque, emotional, dramatic, somewhat ornate. It's a lot. Like Baroque is a lot. I think is a very good way oh, to yeah. kind of like sum it up. And uh, just to give you an even clearer definition, pulling out the Honest Art Dictionary. Yes. I because we wouldn't. wrote it because we, we wrote, wrote a book. Yeah. <laughs> We're never going to stop talking this is just about a, it. Nope. It's just a solid opportunity to promote something we made. So I'm going to do that. We've got the Baroque entry in here written by Ginny. So this is kind of a layered thing. You've got Corey here reading Ginny. <laughs> I like it. Jenny and I, I like are it. listening as colleagues. <laughs> All right. Baroque. Noun or adjective. It's bold, strange, sexy, theatrical, and emotional. It's the Baroque baby, and I love it. Baroque art is known for its dramatic, dynamic, evocative, and rich qualities, which stood in contrast to the more formulaic and simple aesthetic preferences of the earlier Renaissance. Baroque style developed in Italy over the course of the 17th century. Architecture from this period displayed undulating curves, elaborate arches, twisting forms, and a variety of rich materials. Sculpture was no longer static, but captured a moment in time as sculpted forms gesticulated, ran, grasped, embraced, and fought. Paintings were theatrical and stimulating as they conveyed scenes from mythology and the Bible. Baroque art was full of bold ambition and aimed to appeal to the senses, coaxing emotional reactions out of viewers. To that I say, hell yes, Baroque, coax these emotions. Boom. Love it. They coax them. I really love that the word dynamic got in there because that's always the word that I'm just like, dynamic. It's dynamic. (laughs) You (laughs) gotta say (laughs) dynamic. You know? (laughs) Yeah. Um, you better say that it's dynamic. <laughs> it's um, dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> so, also, if you if you want uh, to know more about dynamic, the word dynamism is also in our book. Yeah. So it's all there. It's all there. There's, There's a lot of words everything. in that book. You know, it's almost like it's a dictionary or something. We fit <laughs> as yeah. many yeah. words as we possibly could in that book. That's that's the truth. <laughs> we truly did. We truly did. But um, yeah, so that's kind of a general idea of the Baroque. Obviously, there you can just there's so so many directions you can go, so many layers to all of this. And people have written papers and books and endless amounts on this topic. So if that interests you, you can go a little a little deeper into just the nature of the Baroque uh, through your own research. But today we're going to focus, as we said, on three artists that uh, fall under the umbrella of this style. Yeah, it's hard to narrow them down because there are many. And we did a specific episode on Artemisia Gentileschi, which is one of the more prominent um, Baroque painters, but because we did like a whole episode on her, 
we aren't including her in this one. She's obviously. She's the baddest bitch of the bro. Yeah. 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 Right. In her own league. Right. Yeah. That's another early episode. Um, If you haven't listened to it, head on over and give it a, a, a listen because um, we're going to talk about it in this episode too but the what makes these women the bad bitches of the Baroque is because this is we're talking 17th century a lot of the Baroque is uh, centered in like Italy and 17th century Italy was not uh, really a place where women could really Uh, be like an independent uh, artist not living under the shadow of like a famous dad or um, Mm -hmm. some sort of male mentor and so in order for a female artist to distinguish themselves as a powerhouse in the Baroque on their own is a pretty huge endeavor so we'll talk about it definitely all right we ready ready to get going Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's right. let's start baddies. with the baddies. The baddies. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to be talking about Judith Leister. Judith Leister. Oh, oh, nice. That was hey, that fun. Was great. <laughs> that was a good, <laughs> good phonetic writing. What if Natalie was Dutch, you guys? <laughs> what what if? Are you Dutch? What if? <laughs> it's a secret. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to call her Judy from time to time because I like that name. I like Judy. Yeah, it makes me happy. So Judy, uh, we don't have a birth date for her, so we can't do our usual little uh, astrology second. But she was baptized on July 28th, 1609. So we have a relative age. So we know around when she was born, you know, usually baptize a baby when they're small. I don't know. I don't have one, but she was from (laughs) Harlem, the one with two A's, you know, the one. And she worked during what was called the Dutch Golden Age. Um, So they were very proud of this time. And I like this fact a lot. Her father owned the Leicester Brewery. So that's actually like how they got their family name was the brewery that he ran Mm -hmm. in their town. So, I, you know, using like our period I period mind thing it's not like having a craft brewery nowadays but in my mind it kind of is and I'm just gonna hold that near to my heart makes her <laughs> seem a little bit cooler she's um, very trendy hipstery, very yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah 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 I mean she's uh she probably had like a a real strong opinion about IPAs mm. and uh definitely you know she just seemed like a force, honestly, like all the things that I've read about her just are tinged with misogyny. Like she was dealing with misogyny constantly and it kind of affected almost like everything that we have record of her doing. But she kept just powering through and she was mentioned in, you know, this description from an artist in Harlem. Honestly, I, because the names are so hard to say, I'm not going to like specifically say a lot of these male artists names just because it's not about them but she was mentioned in a 1628 uh, description and she was only 19 years old at the time so just the fact that she was being written about talked about at such a young age that she was already successful enough to be written about is pretty cool and she also completed almost all of her artistic output between 1629 and 1635. So like a really short span of time, especially considered considering that she was a pretty successful artist in her own right. A few of her genre paintings, that's what she was painting at the time. It's also super popular in, you know, Protestant Dutch culture. Um, A lot of these paintings were selling like multiples. We talked about this in the Artemisia Genelesky episode, but when an artist gets kind of really good at painting something, then they're often commissioned to do that style of painting, that same painting again and again and again, make some money. So a little bit about her painting style. She very, very likely apprenticed or worked with artist Franz Halls, but there's not 
anything that says that she for sure did. And this is where it gets a little interesting because she was not recognized as an artist until 1893. So from after her death until 1893, Mm. big chunk of time, she was yeah ain't erased. that just the way like <laughs> and feel like that's such a thing unfortunately and franz halls is the artist who got credit for her works that were still being sold and circulated uh yeah so this is where it gets complicated <laughs> right <laughs> hurts <laughs> and and i you know art historians like it's The way that we art historians write about things is just I get why it has to be super objective sometimes. But there's just like these little nuggets that I read. And when I put it all together in my head, I'm like, this is dramatic. Like this is a dramatic Mm -hmm. situation because she um, was witness to like signed witness to one of his children's baptism. So like at some point they must have had some sort of pretty close relationship um even if it was just his friends or you know professionals whatever but um he also like i don't think claims to have taught her or apprenticed her and he swiped one of her assistants so let me back up a second she was a guild member which was a huge deal she was the first female guild member of this saint luke's guild only one of two in the 17th century. She was the first. And she had three students under her, which is cool. Um, they were dudes, but Franz stole one and he took him and then she reported it and he was fined. Franz was fined, but was able to keep the assistant. So there was just some shit going down between them. And then it just so happens that he is the artist that everyone attributed all of her work to. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that he like did that himself, but it's pretty sketchy. Um, I don't know if it's because I have, uh, you know, because at the beginning of this episode, we were talking about you disappearing, Natalie. <laughs> but the way you described that, I imagined it as though Franz Hall's like kidnapped this, <laughs> like put him in a like, cage. Yeah. yeah paint apprentice, brushes, like, paint. like swooped him up in a bag and like took him on his way. <laughs> it's so no. funny to imagine a time where it was like this huge scandal to have like stolen a student from another master or whatever you know it's like (laughs) just with the state of like what it's like to get an arts education today i'm like y'all were fighting over the students back then that's (laughs) awesome (laughs) (laughs) so true but yeah and i mean I don't think the kidnapping part was probably necessary because, again, all the misogyny going on, he probably just yeah. uh, said something to him. And Willingly. the guy was like, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm going to go with mm-hmm. you. Um, yeah. What a dick. But again, we don't have like a ton of details. So I get why people aren't speculating wildly, but I'm going to because it's more fun. Um, so it just seems like there was some shit going down between Franz, Hall's, Franz Hall and our girl, Judy. And in 1893, when she was rediscovered, it was because they found her monogram, which is very distinct. It's a five pointed star with her initials intertwined in it, which is objectively just very cool. Um, And that was hidden underneath a Franz uh, Hall's signature. (gasps) Oh, So, you know, like, Hmm. what the fuck? (laughs) Wow. (laughs) What a dick. Yeah, not not great. So, again, they had some sort of relationship. She saw his kid get baptized, um, but she still had a successful career. Like, she did her own thing up until she got married. This is misogyny round two. And then she pretty much stopped painting, not completely, but her production slowed way down. We have almost no paintings from after she was married. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's especially a bummer is that 
her husband, who's also an artist, they shared a studio. So like she was painting and there's no way to tell how much she contributed to his work that was still being produced and circulated. Um, But I mean, it's pretty likely that she at least did something in his work or helped. And again, I just I get so bothered by this like lack of um, authorship for her, which I do have to acknowledge is a little bit not not problematic, but I question it because it's not something that bothers me when it's like two men. (laughs) But you throw in a female artist who's getting slighted in this situation and suddenly I'm like enraged to my yeah. core. I think it's an interesting thing because like that situation with her husband is is kind of fascinating because like obviously I I don't know I don't know very much about her or the situation but like it's very possible that it was seen as like a joint effort thing because they they have a joint household, right? So it's like mm-hmm. her husband making money is her making money is mm-hmm. their family right. making money. So right. it's it's very possible it was an entirely like her choice, yeah. like she you know type thing, like yeah, intentional. Like she was happy to help with that with the production of her husband's work because it was all in support of their family. You know, it's. Mm-hmm. Um, and and yeah, and obviously looking at it in 2021, yeah, there is that little bit that's like justice for Judy, but like, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, it's also you know different time, different, different, uh, just yeah, different approaches to the production of art, and the authorship question is a forever question too. Like how Truly. much value. Do we even want to put on authorship? You know, like yeah. That, yeah. yeah, that's a big question. Exactly. And I feel like usually our stance is like authorship maybe isn't as important as some art historians try to make it out to be. And especially like Corey said, depending on the time and what was going on societally, guilds were notoriously a place where there was like multiple hands going into mm-hmm. paintings like that was so normal. Um But yeah, it's just with a modern feminist eye, it's really hard to not have that knee jerk reaction to it. Totally. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Right. And I I think that that is something that is hard for a lot of 21st century uh, art appreciators to recognize wrap their minds around that the For concept sure. of of like the individual artist and the the prestige o- accorded to a single artist is a relatively newer invention mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but still it sounds like there was fuckery <laughs> but <laughs> a little bit i mean i mean yeah chances are there was at least some fuckery like mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> trace amounts of fuckery at minimum mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. so um I do also, though, want to talk about like just the practicality of her stopping painting after getting married and having children. Like even if it wasn't because she was being repressed by the patriarchy 100 percent, like having kids is objectively exhausting. Totally. (laughs) It was more so back then. It just was. (laughs) She was busy, yeah. man. She was, she was busy. busy. <laughs> and not only was she raising the kids, running the, you know, the domestic life of her family, she also was running the family business, you know, their workshop. So she's managing shit. Um, yeah. And again, this is me totally speculating, but it could have been that that just better suited her skills and that mm-hmm. her husband's name was easier to sell as... 100 percent. I mean, that's a huge thing, too. There are so many stories of artists and and authors. I feel like this is a big one in the literature world, you know, like women, uh, you know, writing and and then their husbands, you know, like um, uh, Mm -hmm. Mary Shelley is Mm -hmm. is a huge one. And Percy Shelley, like mm -hmm. Frankenstein was was not originally under Mary Shelley's name. And it's just because a woman's name wasn't going to sell, you know, Mm -hmm. like. 
Exactly. So exactly. There's there's practical reasons for these things from the woman's perspective. And yes, it's at large patriarchal, but like it's still, you know, the best way to go about things from probably the woman's perspective in that situation. Yes. 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 Totally. Um, and so like like Corey talked about, you know, <laughs> How's, how's our bug doing? How's Lucifer? I know. I saw that. I was <laughs> acting up. <laughs> He's getting upset about all this misogyny. Like I'm, yeah, he is. I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm cool with his presence, but he came across my, my note page. Mm. So I stay in your, stay in your lane, I just bro. put him back. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so like Corey mentioned earlier, you know, Protestant, uh, Baroque, subject matter is slightly different than catholic yeah. um catholic you know lots of religious scenes and stuff in the netherlands holland i never know what to call it holland uh, netherlands or holland netherlands. yeah yeah whichever you prefer listener mm-hmm. um they were into <laughs> genre paintings into this like kind of merchant class representation mm-hmm. so like people yeah. wanted to see images that look kind of like them which, you know, mm-hmm. we can all relate to. People so, having fun, having a good yeah, time. Exactly. And because she grew up in a brewery, she knew how to paint people having a good time. Um, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, she did. You want to get into the paintings? One more yeah, time. yeah I it. really love this first one that you have up here. The self-portrait. She looks like she's in the middle of laughing, which but is so chilling. cool. Yeah. Because yeah. it, it it looks l- kind of like a photograph. Like she's caught like mid, s- like almost like she's like about to say something, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's like very intentional. So I'm glad you said that, like she's about to say something because between her facial expression and her body positioning where she's resting her elbow mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. that like pointed part of her chair it's very momentary. Like that's yeah. not a position that you would hold for a long time. Yeah. Totally. So she's trying to evoke that like, oh, you just like caught me. Um, <laughs> this like, just caught me reminds painting. me so much of since I'm I've become the art history babes like TikTok curator, like that's like it's because you're the only one who knows how to use it, Corey. <laughs> yeah. Let's be real. I'm never by default as an TikTok <laughs> person here. This reminds me of like a TikTok trend where there's a certain audio. I can't remember what song it is, um, and and it's actually it's really cute. It's really sweet. I I I really like this trend because um, I think it's a very positive one. Um, and it's basically you set up your phone and you're supposed to like look away as though you're talking to someone. And then when the music switches, you look over as if someone just called your name. And that what it evokes is like you know this is what people see when mm-hmm. you know when you first like look at them or whatever and. <laughs> And there are a lot of them where like the person like the person will do it and then they'll see it and then they'll get really emotional because they'll like see how beautiful they are in that like moment. Mm-hmm. It's a really sweet trend. Like it's very like um, in that. Yeah. In that like very natural moment. And I mean, and obviously people have taken it and memed it and done funny things with it, of course. But there are a lot of them that I've seen. They're just, you know, young girls realizing they're pretty which is really like heartwarming um and it this reminds me of that because she's creating that moment of looking over right right oh i didn't see you there Mm -hmm. yeah exactly how long have you been here oh my god (laughs) exactly (laughs) yes yes yes. and it and i love also like i think like kind of casual lean back juxtaposed Mm -hmm. with the non-casual dress she is right. dressed to the nines especially <laughs> yeah. like 
that, that collar. Oh, oh. Like, those collars, my God. It looks <laughs> like the collar that you put on your dog to keep it from like biting Scratching. its paw. <laughs> right. Truly, yeah. yeah. The, the cone. Um, no. I mean, you know, obviously there's like a doily on it, but still it's <laughs> it's interesting. That is very northern. So. <laughs> it so is. And yes, like it is. I remember <laughs> learning about these because I had an amazing art history professor in uh, undergrad, uh, shout out Professor Costanza Dopfel, who talked about like the, this trend with the big collars and how they just kept getting bigger and bigger. And she was <laughs> like, they, they had to make the forks longer to like eat <laughs> yeah. around them um, mm -hmm. because it's just genuinely not practical. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. <so> funny. <laughs> Like what a goofy fucking human thing! Fucking like goofy. we're just gonna yeah. make these, and then we, well, then we need new forks. Like what? yeah, so I can no, eat my food at my off. fancy it's dinners. A longer fork. Yeah, it, that's okay. that's so fucking cute. Like that's so cute. It's great, and so um, I feel like it's mimicked a little bit here with the paintbrush, um, mm -hmm. and and also the fact that she's holding like twenty seven paintbrushes in her other hand. I yeah. just feel like she's really trying to like underscore I'm really good at this like yeah. I'm a professional and mm -hmm. this would have been like a resume you know like she's basically saying like this is what I can do and mm -hmm. the painting behind her that character is from one of her most famous works that like sold the best and it was called Mary no that's a different Mary one. Trio no, because I think I included that one. Oh. Let's see if I can find the actual name real quick. That looks so similar. You find that yeah, name that guy looks like the guy in American Oh, then maybe it is. Maybe I just yeah. didn't think because you know, it was so similar. Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think he said that guy. Okay, so I, I took this, uh, this reference from our friends over at Sartle um, from Clayton, who wrote a little bit mm -hmm. about this work, and he called it the Mary Company, which is why I thought it wasn't. But maybe that's just the same painting, especially since like a lot of these don't have titles. Right? The titles. Translation. Oh, yeah. 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 No, I, so I, I think, think you guys it, are right. It definitely is. I feel like that 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 would I don't know maybe be an interesting thing to dive into the like farther we go back into art history, the more like different titles, titles there are get. for one thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. um, we just bring our attention back to her hand holding the twenty-seven paintbrushes mm -hmm. because I don't know if y'all have seen that um, that post. It was like a picture of a woman holding like a phone and yes, like, like all of her shit and just mm -hmm. like how we don't have pockets, so we have had to develop evolve um, crazy grip strength like in our fingers to carry all of her shit. Um, this is like the hand is doing the thing like that hand is a claw it is grasping i feel yeah. like we gotta make a meme there, for that there. i know right this is a great time for a commercial break uh -huh. we have returned uh from from that ad break that uh was commanded by the cosmos <laughs> yeah yes. totally planned totally planned just not didn't have bias. anything <laughs> to do with internet connections or <laughs> weird mic issues or anything like that it was just a planned ad break <laughs> we are professionals we can hold so many microphones with one hand we and are <laughs> in control of the situation everybody <laughs> uh, um, but yes we're back and let's let's go back to nat and talk about uh some more Judas painting. Judy Pooty. Nice. <laughs> cute. I wish this was an episode just about her because I would name it that. <laughs> I know. Right. That'd be cute. Uh, so interestingly, like obviously from a practical sense, we're talking about her self-portrait and how she put one of her characters from one of her most famous best-selling paintings in the painting behind her. But originally, we now know, after a bunch of fancy x-rays and shit, that it was originally another self-portrait of her, oh. which is so much more interesting. Inception portrait. Yes. 
yes, yes. Which I love the idea of like the conversation between like a little painting of her and then a big painting of her. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And then there's the real her painting the painting of the painting of her. She (laughs) should have left it like that. I I, I'm intrigued what the self portrait was because I like to imagine it as literally just like an inverse of this exact painting. So like she's looking over her shoulder and like she's looking over her shoulder. God, that'd be so good. good. That would be so good if it was. But this is not the only instance of one of her paintings being painted over in this way. So I think it a lot of times just had to do with being you know a commercial artist and like needing to sell your paintings and needing to make paintings that people actually wanted to buy and I think that the message here is unfortunately there weren't a lot of buyers for paintings of females painting themselves um Mm -hmm. nowadays I think that shit would kill but you would buy it yeah but at the time, I, I guess it wasn't popular. Um, so we'll get to that in a second. But really quickly, I just we have to talk about this painting because it's one of my favorites. It's ever. the best painting. Like it's it's painting. I'm it's it's almost the whole reason I wanted to talk about her. I'm just it's gonna say one it. of the weirdest images of oh, I love it. <laughs> so it's called a boy and a girl with a cat and an eel. Yeah. I just don't understand. That little girl <laughs> looks like the little girl from fucking um uh, the witch. The witch. Oh my god. Uh, like yes. her. Looks yes. just like her. Looks like a, a creepy haunted <laughs> little jerk. Devil worshiper. <laughs> Devil yeah. child. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And 100%. So the backstory to this painting, which I would have never put together. It's very like, uh, again, got to be in that mind of a 17th century Dutch person. Uh-huh. Apparently, like eels would be used to lure cats like it's like a tasty treat. So the whole what we're supposed to infer from this is that the kids used the eel to lure the cat and then trapped the cat and got it and that's why they're so happy and the cat is so pissed what are they gonna do that cat just fuck with him are you kidding me that's what kids always do with cats have you ever Mm -hmm. been around children and cats i guess cats are sharp dude i don't i just i'm surprised (laughs) that kids want to mess with cats exactly and then so that is supposedly more of like the metaphor of this like the uh the symbolism is that yeah you can see like if you zoom in you can see the cat's claws that are out Mm. because he is pissed Mm -hmm. um and the likelihood of these kids getting scratched is probably pretty high and then on top of that (laughs) apparently judy was trying to make a bigger statement just about like human beings so more like adult human beings and it's that concept of like playing with fire but um that could also explain the creepiness of the children because they kind of have adult like faces they so have. very no, no, much she's have definitely, adult like faces she's definitely a baby grandma like yes yeah. <laughs> like, yeah like the vibe for sure um, I, I do feel like we also need to talk about his face too, though. Oh like, yeah. What? No. <laughs> like, yeah. Like that looking like, I don't Oh, This is such a weird painting. It's, like, it's so it is. bizarre. It's bizarre. And like the very like harsh spotlight on, on his that face, boy's yeah. face yeah. and his uh-huh. like ridiculous hat. It's just, <laughs> there's a lot of weirdness it's, here, which is it's very, too much. The it's weirdness. <laughs> It's so exemplary of Northern painting, mm. yeah. period. Yeah. It's like my dream couple's costume, honestly. Oh, that's a good one. That's That a good would one. be... Dibs. Fantastic. That would yeah, be a good one. I was just out on in Midtown on Saturday. I'm sure that I saw a guy wearing that exact outfit. So. <laughs> cool. Cool. It's in my brand. way. I don't know. I don't know how much there is to say about this one beyond that. I just like we had no, to. I think, we, it. I think we got it. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so last one, last one for Judy is called The Last Drop. And it was I painted in one. 1639. And 
this was outside of that original time frame where she painted most of her paintings. And I really love this one. It supposedly goes with an earlier painting that was painted about 10 years prior. And the messaging in this has everything to do with drinking and that point in the night where you're getting to the last drop and she's getting a little crazy. And what do we have here with our uh, our <gasps> fellas is a little skeleton, pal. <laughs> Always oh. want to talk about a little skeletons, a little memento mori mm, peeking oh, up in the back. He's not subtle. He has another skull in his arm. He's yeah. got a little <laughs> flame and he's got a. Uh, What's it called? Hourglass. Uh, hourglass. Yeah, I like a, I like a skeleton holding a skull. Like that's like really, meta, right? <laughs> it's like, like we're just du- like doubling down. Like in like, case you missed, head that you I grab. was made of bones. Yeah, <laughs> here is another. Skull. Here's more bones. <laughs> bones on bones on bones. Yeah, love it. Um, yeah, and it's I think supposed to be. A little bit of a warning of the you know potential outcome of drinking too much mm-hmm. drinking a lot it, drinking it, it'll get you um but <laughs> again for the time i think i supposedly this was a little bit much because they ended up altering the f- painting but for me now i i'm obsessed with this like yeah. The guy with the upside down beer sign that he's holding to show mm-hmm. it's completely empty, his shirt undone down to almost his belly button, yeah. like his big cigarette that he's holding you know what up. This reminds me of it's one of my favorite episodes of The Office. It's the one where they have that party at Robert California's house. Yes. Oh, and at the yeah. end, it's just they Robert California. Um, uh, m- uh, my boy, Zach Woods, I always yes. forget his character's name, Zach Woods. And then fucking, um, Kelly, Kelly's like boyfriend guy. Ryan. Oh, Ryan. Oh, BJ. Ryan. Or, yep. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. BJ yeah. Novak. BJ Novak. Yes. yes. Um, so at the, yeah, at the end, it's Zach Woods, Ryan, you know, BJ Novak and Robert California. And they're just like in a room. Yes, that's it. Push yourselves, boys. Not a party if you don't do something that scares you. I ain't a breather. Oh. Oh. You two keep going. Hey, need to sleep. We can just leave. So leave. And it, it feels like this, like because Zach Woods <laughs> and Ryan are like trying to like keep the party going. But it's like the end. It's the very end. They're there till the end. And I get a very similar energy. I don't know. I don't is I don't know. I don't know if the Robert California is a skeleton. I'm not sure. But I get a very <laughs> similar vibe from this painting of that yeah. moment in the night where it's just. The, the last few who are going hard sure. and like have something to prove almost. Right. You know? yeah. it's, it's the end. Yeah. And I have fallen asleep like hours before. <laughs> yeah. You're, you've long since gone to bed. <laughs> yeah. So this this is supposed to be, you know, the accompanying image to that one that we talked about earlier. The. Um, Mary Company or Mary Trio, depending on who you ask. And yeah, they're the same size. There's just a lot of evidence that they were supposed to go together. And it's like, you know, the beginning of the night and the end of the night, which is very relatable. This Um, is the pool party. This is when everyone's still around. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Um, But unfortunately, Apparently, they painted over the skeleton. So only recently oh. did the Philadelphia Museum x-ray and then like find the original image and then clean it and restore it to the skeleton. Before wow. that, it had awesome. been painted over by another figure because someone had decided at a certain point that it was just too much of a bummer to have that memento mori <laughs> in the painting. And so don't harsh the vibe, man. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was like, come 
on. That's not someone called it a buzzkill. And I was like, nah, man, that's the opposite of a buzzkill. Like that's that's yellow energy. Like <laughs> right. it really is though. It really is. Um but yeah, so we'll post all of those images. I feel like I've been talking forever, so I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Jen. Are you next or is it Ginny? Oh yeah, I'll go next. So yeah, we just talked about um, our our gal from the north. Um, now let's let's bring it down. Let's bring it down to the south. We're going to Italy. It's going warm. downtown. It's, you have to talk in that deep voice the whole time. <laughs> you know, it's it's warm. There's pasta and wine. <laughs> We're in Italy. We're talking about Elisabetta Serrani, who is a bad bitch, like for real. Mm-hmm. I I don't I didn't know much about this artist before we started doing research for this episode. And I have this like affinity for this woman. Um, she was a stressed out queen, which um, really appeals to me uh, in particular. <laughs> so let's get into Elisabetta. She was born January 8th, 1638, Capricorn baby um which you will hear it's uh, she was a uh, such a capricorn um a workaholic workaholic um she was born in bologna in northern italy um so that's important where she was based in well we'll talk about that in a second she was the eldest daughter uh eldest child really of the bolognese artist um and art merchant Giovanni Andrea Serrani, um, who was not only a respected artist and art merchant, he was also one of the best art appraisers in the town, and he was a professor of art in the city. So very established figure in the arts in Bologna during this time. And so Elisabetta had the sort of traditional upbringing that a lot of these women who were born to artist fathers had so he trained her in painting drawing and printmaking and interestingly she also had a solid grounding in art theory this is interesting and important to note because um the arts i mean let's be real have never really been uh equal opportunity type of uh, employment for women um, as opposed to men, but especially during the 17th century. Um, Women artists were purposefully uh, restricted from learning art theory. So like you couldn't learn art theory, Mm -hmm. like you just, you could only learn like the, to connect the dots, basically. It was um, not a very welcoming environment for Um, a woman artist. So she got that sort of um, solid grounding in art theory that goes on to really help her in her career. Um, So her father, he ran a successful painting and printmaking studio, and he had been apprenticed to a famous Italian painter by the name of Guido Reni. Reni, he taught um, in a uh, idealizing classical style. And this was passed down to Elisabetta through her father. So later on, she kind of develops her own personal expressive manner um, that you would expect from a Baroque artist. Serrani uh, became very popular she was really good Um, and she garnered a lot of praise from her contemporaries and mentors and she was well known for her madonnas so one of the first images that we have here is the madonna contemplating the baby jesus from 1664 i really love this painting because she's just kind of like peeling open his little his little (laughs) wrap like oh look at him you know, he'll grow into it, you know, um, <laughs> he's, she's really contemplating that baby. Um, and I, I, I love it very much. It's, it's a great painting, great, 
great fat baby. Great I love a little chubby baby. Those mm-hmm. little rolls. The rolls. Good rolls kid. on rolls. That's a that's a thick baby. That's a Rubenesque baby. <laughs> really? <laughs> Um, so, you know, she was known for her Madonnas. Um, she was also known for being one of the first women to practice printmaking, like period. Um, so that is pretty impressive, um, that she was also skilled in that field. And so Sarani quickly holds her own as an artist. And in her mid twenties, she became the master of the Sarani workshop um, because her father had to stop painting when he became uh, incapacitated by arthritic gout, which sounds Mm -hmm. really bad. Um, His hands like really became malformed and he could no longer paint. Um, So in her mid twenties, she becomes the primary breadwinner for her big ass family Mm -hmm. and um her studio was actually highly successful not not to cut you off real quick but that actually that parallels i didn't say it but that parallels uh judith leister too same thing happened at a certain point her dad died and she became like responsible for uh supporting her family and i think she was like the eighth child too like Mm -hmm. damn right Um, just carrying shit on their backs well, yeah, like um, Elisabetta was the oldest. And so and she was very talented. So it makes sense that she became the master of the studio and she was very successful. Um, her studio uh, through the um, the fees of her pupils um, and also portrait commissions and whatever commissions she had, she was able to support her entire family. And so. Uh, in order to really understand uh, what makes Judith extraordinary, we need to talk a little bit about um, the context. So we mentioned earlier that in the 17th century, there weren't a lot of opportunities for women and especially not in the arts. You have two options as a woman during this time, which is to get married or to enter into a convent. That's it, <laughs> um, which is like, oh, my God. Yikes. Um, but uh, Elisabetta did neither um, because largely due to the progressive atmosphere in Bologna in the 17th century. Um, so Bologna was uh, different from a lot of the rest of not just Italy, but all of Europe. Mm-hmm. Um where they celebrated a humanist tradition and that includes that uh, women were celebrated as artists and women could study women could teach they could be published Um, and so female artists were not just accepted but they were respected in their own right bologna was also the center of the largest school of female artists in italy Um, So all of this really helps establish um, Elisabetta and also having an artist father who already had an established studio um, really goes a long way. For Um, sure. And so uh, she really began to pioneer her own teaching style. She developed this, um, what I have seen called a matrilineal pedagogic model. All right. So (laughs) So many syllables. (laughs) What this means is that um, she took on female pupils and these girls were taught to draw and paint by other women Mm -hmm. um, rather than by their husbands or brothers or fathers. Um, And in her studio, she also uh, taught her two younger sisters, Barbara and Anna Maria, who were also painters. Um, so it became like a center for uh, women artists. Um, and Super so that's cool. pretty cool. Yeah, I, I just I think that that is so rad. And I I don't know. I love I love to hear it. So she was. Uh, very much admired by her contemporaries and this is where it gets a little bit uh, frustrating for me in particular because um, a lot of her 
a lot of the contemporaries people who knew her and then people who became like her biographers so her main biographer this guy carlo cesare malvasia he was a mentor but he also talked about her after her death um was one of several who admired her technical skills and um considered her uh, a female virtuoso virtuoso um but they the the big compliments were that her work was masculine Mm -hmm. she was considered uh virile and grand and um in a letter by padre bonaventura bc um to um leopoldo de medici he writes about her that she painted like a man with much boldness and invention and this is like this huge compliment you know um Uh. and it's like (laughs) okay she painted like a man i don't know what the Mm -hmm. fuck that means but she painted well (laughs) right yeah that's what they're saying and but it's it it also like i don't know it's just uh, you know, we could we could go off on any sort of like feminist rant, but it's the it's the ultimate like issue kind of with um, being a woman and moving through a patriarchal world is it's not just about being a woman. It's that to succeed, you have to be like a man. So it's like sure. this um, this down playing or this uh unappreciation belittling, lack of appreciation belittling yeah. Yeah. belittling and totally. lack of appreciation for anything deemed feminine so it's like yeah. the masculine is always the good and the yeah. only way to succeed as a woman is to do the masculine thing and which is a trap most- because it's all yeah. arbitrary and honestly it sounds like in her lifetime elisabetta was like sick of these motherfuckers like it, like <laughs> I'm sure she was <laughs> she was and so um you know she had a career that spanned only a decade but in that time she painted over 200 canvases which is about 20 canvases a year um she was praised for having extraordinary speed and productivity something unusual about Serrani's work, um, which nowadays wouldn't be so unusual, but she signed all of her paintings. And during this time, many of her male counterparts were not signing their paintings. Mm. So she would like big time sign her name um, as a way to further prove like, yes, I'm painting these. And one time, she got so pissed off that people were doubting that she could really paint that much that she invited 13 of her accusers to come watch her paint a portrait in one sitting. Sick. Uh, oh, that's so the kind of pettiness like, that I'm here for. That's so good. So I'm just, I just, I have to great. both that and going back to the whole like kind of masculine. Uh, aspects of her work and yeah that exact encounter there all of that is such capricorn energy i know <laughs> like, energy like my daddy moon. energy capricorn. so maybe she was yeah. masculine but like it's still an annoying i mean phrase. totally i mean capricorn energy is is the daddy of the zodiac and like i've you know i have a capricorn moon and like i i i understand daddy Daddy. energy um (laughs) right in a in a pretty like personal way and yeah i i totally get that like being doubted in any way and then being like oh yeah motherfucker like (laughs) like, right i will show you i will show you the work like that is such capricorn energy Mm -hmm. i feel like Mm -hmm. it is and another thing that is so capricorn energy is that this girl um i I think it's safe to say she worked herself to death. Um, oh, yeah, that yeah, <laughs> she worked herself to death. The um, the incident of the you know inviting her accusers to watch her paint a portrait in one sitting happened a year before she died, mm-hmm. um, and so uh, in August of 1665 uh, she died. And at first it was suspicious. Um, you know, it's, it felt like it was sudden. Um, and to the point where her father 
tried to press charges against a maid servant who had atten- attempted to quit a few days before Wait. she died. Was her dad dead? No, her dad was still alive. He didn't die. He just couldn't paint anymore because oh, oh, his, oh, sorry, sorry. His I misunderstood. Arthritis his made his hands all, you know, crap. Got it. Um, so uh her father uh pressed charges against this woman who was the <laughs> servant. They charged her with poisoning um Elisabetta. They put her on trial, um, but the charges were later dropped by her father. Um, her biographer, this guy, Malvasia, he um, attributed her death to love sickness because Sarani never married and was 27 oh when she died. Which I, was, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. I know. <laughs> um, and I hate that so much. <laughs> it's true. I mean, she, she never got married. She never had children. She was a single professional woman. Um, and oh this was God. at a time where uh, being a, a, a professional woman was like a totally new category in the social sphere. Yeah. You were either a mother or a wife or a nun. You didn't have a successful studio. You weren't a successful independent artist. Um, so when so she died, suddenly, you. <laughs> right. When she died, suddenly people started to say like, well, it's because she never got married and she was heartbroken. Oh and because we know notoriously that childbirth is what keeps women alive. At, like, sure. Yes. Yeah. But uh, um, more yeah. than likely, what really happened is that she was tasked with taking care of her big ass family Um in her mid twenties. And, um, it was discovered that she had a peptic ulcer that ruptured and so oh. she more than likely died of, um, peritonitis, um, which is basically just a terrible, like abdominal infection, um, that you would get if something like an ulcer ruptured, mm-hmm. um, I mean, you could die from that now and you certainly would die from it in the 17th century. Mm-hmm. Um, peptic ulcers famously caused by stress. Yeah. So, um, mm. there it is, you know, um, she was a really badass woman though. And I feel like in her short amount of time on this planet and her, uh, decade long career, she really, um, was a figure for just a just a powerhouse among women artists and and a, and a example of of what education for female artists could look like mm-hmm. and attempting to separate the discipline from yeah having like a successful father or your husband or your brother or whatever like attempting to create some level of independence so of course because uh we could attribute feminist ideals to the life of Sarani. Um, we tend to look at her work through that lens. So a lot of the subject matter um, is, I would say, typical of Baroque painting and mm-hmm. especially when we compare to like Gentileschi, who's always compared to Serrani since these are like the two big right. Baroque Italian artists. Um, so what we have as far as subject matter goes are works that exemplify like the word that I saw here was femmes fortes or strong women. Mm-hmm. Um, and so these are um, like biblical references to say judith who slayed holofernes um we have a lot of examples that was a very popular uh subject during the baroque and especially we have the example of um artemisia's judith beheading holofernes um there is the famous caravaggio that we talk about and then um so serrani painted um several different ones I didn't include an image here of that one because, you know, you've seen one, you've seen them all. Um, no, that's not true. They're great. I love all of them. Um, I love this one, though, that like right under the Madonna. Oh, yeah. So you staring know, at t- it. Tim McClaya of Thebes. Um, the story goes that she pushes her um, rapist down a well and then throws big rocks on him. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's a very um, 
famous story um, from uh, the classical world. And um, I also, uh, cause I couldn't decide what to put. I just put both of them. This next image here is actually a self portrait mm -hmm. of Elisabetta as um, mm -hmm. Cersei, Cersei. Mm -hmm. which I'm actually not very familiar with that story, but that was sort of an example of her as an anti-heroine, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's kind mm -hmm. of interesting that she shows her self-portrait as a more like reviled woman mm -hmm. um so that's interesting, interesting. yeah and we talked um, about cersei a bit in our witches episode yeah she was a, a witch yeah so exiled to an island because she was too powerful there is also i did include this image i, I didn't know if i was going to but the um painting is of um portia the wife of Brutus, who famously uh, betrays Caesar. Um, this is an image of Portia. She's inflicting a wound to her thigh. And the story is that um, Portia wanted to um, prove herself to her husband um, that she could share in his burdens and secrets, like wanted to know what the hell was going on. And so to convince her husband of her like strength of will she um just stabs herself in the thigh i guess that's a hot just, picture uh, like, i mean i was I just gonna about... say this is like a sexy picture yeah i don't <laughs> I know about to talk like, about it so content context it, but right so like it's you know because every time that we do talk about women in in the baroque and in art history there's almost there's always like this tendency to want to do a feminist reading and so this is a an image of this woman who's like look how badass i am i'm gonna you know uh, mutilate myself in order to prove how strong i am but i actually challenge that this is like the opposite like i wouldn't call this a feminist work i think that this is um, I think this is like a sadomasochistic image. Like, I think that there's like some sexuality here in like the sort of like self flagellating act of like, I'm gonna do this, this act and it's dark, you know, she's inside, there's like heavy drapery and it's, it's violent, but it's also sexual. Cause you have very. her exposed thigh, which is like mm -hmm. very, I don't know, like breasts are like not as big of a deal I feel like but when you see the inside of a thigh in one of yeah. these paintings it's like oh my god you yeah. know and it's it's kind of disturbing like it's there's somber lighting the colors are really rich she's looking like half disrobed um and I just I don't really see this as a, a feminist work I think that this is more of like it's Serrani being like I can paint for the male gaze you know like I I, I I don't know. I guess my instinct to push back on that is like just because it is sexual in nature. And yes, there is definitely like this like sadomasochistic vibe. I don't think that necessarily needs to mean it's not feminist. Um, I think it's just the act of like she's mutilates herself in order to be taken yeah. seriously by her yeah. husband. It's kind of like, damn. The story for sure doesn't sound very feminist to me but the painting itself i think has its own kind of like power and especially exactly. what you everything you've told us about sarani is like i don't think that she was making this for men i would be shocked if she had the male gaze and like it could be a hot woman of a lady for ladies or for yeah. her you know like we don't <laughs> we don't know why she didn't marry maybe it had something to do with her sexuality like who knows? It's a hot ass picture. I can say that here in this year, 2021. So exactly. Exactly. Um, Cause I'm sitting here with my female gaze and feeling things. So like, I, I, I think it's more like, I, I, I totally agree that yes, obviously the story has these layers of, of her engaging in some kind of sacrificial pain for a man and, and, that's not uh, doesn't necessarily line up with feminist ideology, but like I just I, I yeah I I don't I don't see it as not feminist either because I think 
we often put feminism into this very like into a box of like, you know, yeah, it can in, it can't include stuff like this. Um, and so being as it was painted by a woman and it feels like a very powerful image sexually and otherwise, I still feel like it's empowering to women to a certain degree. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I love this painting. It's really, there's a lot going on. Um, I think that I also kind of read like an autobiographical like aspect of it. Just kind of like, I don't know. (laughs) I get the feeling. I mean, Sarani was a, she was a stressed out lady. Like this woman who's literally stabbing herself just to be like, yeah, like I'll bleed for you. Like what more do you want from me? You know, Mm -hmm. like I, I kind of, and also her face is just very almost like apathetic. Like, yeah, a thousand percent. That's the word I keep thinking. Yes. You know, um, and then it's interesting uh, because o- outside of the subject matter, um, you know, as far as the story goes, if we just look at this painting for its um, just what we're seeing purely subject matter, the focus is on this gorgeous dress and this beautiful fabric. And it was painted for a silk merchant, this guy, sure. uh, mm-hmm. um, S- S- Simon Tassi. <laughs> Very Italian pronunciation. Um, <laughs> Simon Tassi, the silk merchant of Bologna. Um, um, that's great. Um, so silk merchant also- of Bologna? <laughs> there we go. Oh, uh, I love being an art historian. Uh, <laughs> you know, so this is also a very, this is Elisabetta really uh, flexing her big guns. Like, look, I can do some goddamn fabric. Yeah, you know, really. Like yeah. So really fun. And then lastly, I'm just, I'm not going to talk very much about this one because it's another famous beheading work, which you know, I'm starting to think like you can't be a woman in the Baroque and not paint a beheading. Yeah, um, it's we mentioned dramatic, man. It's dramatic. Mm-hmm. She, you know, we mentioned um, that she had painted a Judith beheading Holofernes, although her Judith is shown with the head after the fact. She doesn't show the actual beheading like Gentileschi's. Um, this is another um, image here, uh, Herodias with the head of john the baptist so another famous biblical beheading and um i really gravitated towards this artist because when i was just a little baby metalhead one of the first um technical death metal albums i ever bought was none so vile by cryptopsy and the um which is a canadian death metal band for the uninitiated the um album artwork is this painting it's close of a close-up and um underneath it are just the words none so vile like spaced out and i remember buying that when i was like 12 and thinking like this is so cool (laughs) Um, and i was looking for the the picture of the the album to put into our doc and i found it on this website called spikerot.com cool and the yeah. text underneath it was a uh, none so vile is a masterpiece of sonic depravity that still to this day remains one of the most sickening nefarious <laughs> and inhuman <laughs> albums ever released jesus and it's like so brutal <laughs> it's just like <laughs> That's ridiculous. I and love that. Like having this like painting, like <gasps> um, just juxtaposed with the like, you know, the the death metal logo. And mm-hmm. like, and then when, when you listen to it, it's just immediately like, oh, you know, it's just very <laughs> insane music. And I just remember being like a teenager and just being like, this is so cool. Who's this artist? Like, what why did they choose this painting i don't get it it's just cool (laughs) so that's kind of like how i uh got introduced to this artist long ago and i think that she is brutal she's Mm -hmm. fucking badass Mm -hmm. i i mean honestly like so much of this conversation like all of your research i i i think she's gonna fall into my arsenal of 
archetypal Capricorn. Oh woman. yeah, like, yeah, for sure. She is yeah. a Capricorn woman archetype, through and through, in so many ways. <laughs> yeah, like, just also, unreal. I I love I love her. Also, we're gonna definitely come back to that Porsche painting for our scar content. Whatever ends up coming mm. out of my latest obsession with like scars and scarification, oh, that Porsche one is gonna circle back. Sure. I mean, I'm, I, I am stoked to let's let's talk about self mutilation. Let's just talk about some self harm. It. It'll be it'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> we're there uh, we're, we're we're ready uh, i'm ready for a, it so, <laughs> so yeah, um, let's, yeah, let's a break a break. break okay be right back we back yeah we're back mm-hmm. we've returned we have returned so we have let's returned. Do, do a quick recap bad bitches of the broke artemisia gentileski as always check out the episode on her Mm -hmm. we have got judith judy judes judith leister and then elisabetta serrani capricorn queen (laughs) extraordinaire (laughs) finally died of stress (laughs) died of stress jenny what do you got for us yes okay so i have another Dutch painter, and that is Rachel Ruysch. Oh, wow. Um, or Rachel Ruysch. And yeah, she's you went all later. in. You, you did that. I there. know. Way to go. <laughs> I watched videos on how to pronounce it. So smart. Uh, Love it. You know, I went to school. Uh, <laughs> so I went to school. <laughs> I went to school. <laughs> uh, so good. So Rachel Reich was born in 1664 in early June, which I don't know what that makes her. Gemini. Gemini. Okay, cool. And so what we've kind of talked about already, just in terms of how difficult it was for women painters in the 17th century to establish careers, and especially in Holland, um, it wasn't necessarily that uncommon for women to paint but they were more considered to be amateur painters where it was something they did for fun and then it was assumed that once they got married that it would pretty much stop and in order to train in a painter's guild that was a lot of money which most women's fathers husbands um, would not have approved of um But luckily for Rachel, she came from a quite uh, artistic and quirky family. Um, Her dad, Dr. Frederick Reusch, was a prominent surgeon, anatomist, and botanist. And um, her grandfather on her maternal side was an architect. So she kind of had this fusion of... um, science and art and also like a lot of source material at a young age of like things to study because her dad made these really interesting dioramas where he would preserve like skeletons and uh baby turtles and um I included they were a- really like a memento mori like yes like smorgasbord like uh, mm-hmm. yeah they're and they're really interesting and really fun and weird <laughs> they so remind weird. me of that Damien Hurst weird yeah. documentary he did with all like the sea oh, yeah. sort of thing treasures like, and, and a hand Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. No, they're definitely a like, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, they're done very artistically and very beautifully. And they're definitely like an homage to the natural world in a very yeah. memento mori esque way. Sh- should start <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very macabre, but um, it, it was his 
and he called it, it was kind of known as like a cabinet of curiosities where he had all these different dioramas. And he actually actually later sold his collection to Peter the Great, the Tsar of Russia. Oh, yeah. He liked all that yes. weird shit. <laughs> yeah. Love yeah. That and then his later descendants were like, ah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> ah! <Fuck, man. laughs> Couldn't just buy Give some me like Fabergé bold. eggs, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fucking Fabergé eggs. Give me a diorama with a baby hand holding a turtle coming out of an egg. <laughs> That's my Fabergé egg. Yeah. Dude, that actually reminds me. And I don't know if it was Rachel Royce inspired, but it was definitely this time frame. So it very well might have been. So a few years back, I was in San Diego, the San Diego Museum of Art does a really cool thing every year. I'd love to go again called Art Alive. And um, it's in the spring. And basically they do all like there's there's always a big a big work at, at the very um, front of the museum that's made entirely out of flowers. And what they do, the whole museum, floral artists will recreate works in the museum's with just flowers and then they'll set the flower version in front of the paintings and it's just like that all throughout the museum it's super fun a very cool event but there was one that was definitely baroque like dutch inspired could have possibly been a rachel roish um and it was like yeah it was like you know those like memento mori esque like darker colors and there mm. there was legit a fucking a plastic baby hand there was a baby nice. hand like sticking out of it like yeah. i need to go back and look actually there's a vlog there's a vlog from it so go onto our oh. youtube watch the yeah. vlog and you'll see what i'm talking about <laughs> go but it was find a, a the baby very... hand easter egg yes it was a very interesting floral arrangement based on an old painting and there was a baby hand in it and that was what I was getting at with all of that but <laughs> I like it very much in line with Roish both Roishas and so Rachel would help her dad arrange these dioramas and they would get very creative with them where they'd be like an embalmed fetus wearing a flower crown holding flowers or a bunch of baby skeletons on kidney stones and um, if things from the lungs to look like trees. And it was like a whole, a whole thing. Um, but because okay. he was also a botanist, um, she had a lot of material to study from, from that, where she did intense, intense study of flowers. And not only did her dad have all these things around in their house, he was also really into art that focused on, insects and like flowers and one artist in particular was Otto Marcius van Schreck. <laughs> Shrek. Uh, Shrek. <laughs> oh I know that guy I know him <laughs> Love Green <Shrek>. guy. <laughs> uh, and he painted there's a kind of genre painting called Soto Bosco Ooh. and it's um it's just Italian for like under the ground or uh, um, the forest floor. And so these paintings are often like very dark and they'll show like a bunch of like mushrooms and moss and lizards and bugs. Mm. And it's all just kind of focused on that connection of the earth and what's underneath that initial surface of um, the earth. And so she had all these influences around her at a young age. And then at 15, she was able to apprentice with renowned still life painter, Willem van Aylst. And her dad said, yeah, do it. Gave her the money for it. Uh, he seems like he's a, a good Supportive. Dad. Yeah, supportive. Yeah. And, and also uh, just, um, just uh, I get 17th century, like mad scientist vibe. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Eccentric. Yes. Uh, yeah. Eccentric. Totally. Man. Totally. Um, and it, paid off for him too because she later taught him how to draw and so he actually oh. published illustrations of his dioramas so like that first uh image that i have in our google docs like he he illustrated those so he would 
draw his own very creative creations. And, and then she would, she taught other members of her family. And so she had this really, really honed in this like um, methodical painting style where she would paint a composition and then allow the paint to dry and go in and add minute detail where like, you know, an iridescent insect wing, caterpillar chomped leaves and similar to who she was taught by Willem van Elst, he and a few other painters would um, use techniques where they would actually take moss or and butterfly wings to apply like to stamp. So you would have moss that really had the texture of moss because she was taking moss, dipping it in paint and stamping it onto the surface of her canvases. Um, That's so and cool. I know, isn't that cool? Like a little, little butterfly wing. <laughs> it the feels very kind of going back to the beginning of this episode when we we're talking about like childhood fascination with bugs and rocks and yeah, stuff. It right. just See? feels Full like in, that, in line with that, like that childhood, yeah. you just kind of like making art and it is kind of a way for you to connect with your surroundings and yes. Yeah. Using the things around you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I get, mm-hmm. I just get such a warm, lovely vibe of curiosity when I think about like Rachel Roy and Frederick. Roy. I know. Right. <laughs> it too. just seems yeah. so nice. <laughs> 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 It really is. It really is. Um, yeah. So, you know, her, her paintings, her still lives, you know, it's part of a, a greater history of Dutch painting. And like what Nat was talking about earlier in looking at the differences of more Northern European Baroque painting versus say Italian Baroque painting where, um, you know, Holland was largely Protestant. So you, you don't have as these paintings of like the Madonna and the baby and, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, as much of, of that going on. And so there's a whole subgenre called Vanitas um, that was most popular in Northern Europe. And it was a way of like representing uh, plant life kind of in the phase of decay um, as a reminder that, you know, youth is fleeting, wealth is fleeting, beauty is fleeting, life is fleeting. And so she was part of that larger um, tradition, but very much had her own distinct style and every single one of her paintings has so many details to unlock where like you're looking at it, you know, kind of from a distance and you're like, Oh, like flowers and some butterflies. But then you zoom in closer and you see little holes and leaves from bugs chomping on them. You see like, you know, a tiny little ant crawling up like a a flower petal. I mean, there's, there's worlds within each composition. And um, I, they're, I just love, love, love her work. Do we have any Um, idea about the scale of these? Because I, I'm like imagining that they're small. Like, I don't know. They seem. um, I. I want them to be small. A lot of her works were smaller. Like, I don't, I don't know exactly, but I do think a lot of them were were not mini, but like you know, smaller size (laughs) canvases. Yeah. I yeah, I don't think, I want teeny yeah, I don't tiny. think they're massive. <laughs> a, a little bucket. painting for an ant. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, man. That would yeah, be actually I, really cute, though. Imagine one of these paintings, like, for an ant, and then it would be, like, a world for the ant. I'll like, die. I would just die. Would die. Yeah, you would pass away. I would just pass away. I would see it and pass away. <laughs> oh my god. Um. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> not only was she painting in you know the bigger Vanitas style. Um, also, I don't know how many people might be aware of this, but the Dutch were fucking nuts for horticulture, um, specifically tulip mania. Mm -hmm. So, um, tulips, the bulb trade 
as it was known. Yes, um, yes. Tulips were originally native to Central Asia, so they would be imported oh. to Holland. And um, there was a very particular kind of tulip that had variegated um, lines in it, so it wasn't a solid color. And that actually was due to um, a virus in the tulip itself that Whoa. shortened its already, because the tulip has a, a fairly short lifespan and it made it even shorter. And that was like all the more um of like a like a hard on for dutch people that they were like oh my god you know like this beautiful flower and it's just gonna like bloom for a day and i'm gonna i'm gonna spend so much money on it yeah uh people yeah people really love tulips uh they're pretty great they're nice they're, they're lovely yeah yeah so obviously there's a fair amount of these still lives that try to capture that beauty of the tulip while at the same time working in that vanitas style it's like okay yes like the tulips are beautiful you're gonna buy them but they will die just like you um Ooh. and then the tulip market crashed oh no yeah. <laughs> no yeah, i hate to tell you but it did um <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but despite it, yeah i know despite <laughs> it all she was incredibly successful and um it was very inventive with a lot of her still lives in ways that some of her contemporaries were not where she would combine different flowers from like different regions of the world that bloomed in different seasons so they're kind of these like imaginary bouquets of flowers that would not otherwise exist in the same place at the same time she's also one of the first western painters to depict cacti in one in her uh, still lives yeah oh, it's this like fun. lovely dark kind of bluish painting that's got some uh cactus action in the back it's, it's really so beautiful that like glowing nice. yeah, white flower yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah she was definitely just a really solid example of like tenebrism within the baroque yeah. style like in yeah. in the north like right. that i feel mm -hmm. like i i just i mean i'm I'm, I'm sure other people were doing it too. But when I think of that kind of combination of like Vanitas, like Dutch Vanitas meets Baroque, I feel like she kind of had that cornered a little bit yeah. in that Agreed. Like, mm -hmm. use of contrast in a very oh, yeah. powerful way. Because lots of flowers just like boom, like pop right out. But there's mm -hmm. a lot that like kind of disappear a little bit into the darkness and um yeah, the, the use of light is just incredible. And in all the spaces that they're in, like the one with the cactus, it's kind of in this like very vague space that you can kind of get a sense of, but not really. I so know. all of them, it's a little mysterious. Yeah, there's some very strange, like that molding mm -hmm. in the back mm -hmm. architecturally. I'm like, what part of the wall is this? It's very weird and cool, yeah. and I, I like it. Me too. I wonder which one's the devil's <laughs> trumpet. What's the? Is it the? Is it the red one? Yeah, I think that's yes. the devil's trumpet. Mm -hmm. The trumpet's that little okay. red guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so she was doing quite well. Her prices were high enough that for most of her career, she only had to paint a few paintings a year. Um, and she got married at age 29, an old maid for those standards at that oh, time. Uh, well, <laughs> but she was <laughs> all right. <laughs> what was the I sent you guys on Instagram? Thornback. I just oh. learned this. Oh, I think we're are we all thornbacks? We're now? thornbacks, mm -hmm. yeah. apparently. Mm -hmm. Like we're not even uh what what Finsters? was yeah, we're like we're, we're past the, spinster. Yeah, we're in a whole new level. We're we're thorn backs, which I don't even know what that means, but it just makes me think of stegosauruses. So like yeah. I was down. about to say stegosaurus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> backs back. Yeah, I'll take I'm it. I'm into it. I'm, I'm into gonna watch it. Jurassic Park after this. Oh, that sounds Jurassic cool. Park is so good. <laughs> I'm gonna watch the Lamb before time after this. Yes, there you go. for my speed. Also, just um, anyone out there, anyone out there is into dinosaurs. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> There's um a really great documentary on Hulu called I believe it's Dinosaur 13. 
Yeah, I think it's Dinosaur 13. And it's actually about the it's so good. And it's about South Dakota. It's about the Black Hills. Um, but it's where the uh, it's about all the drama surrounding when uh, Sue was found, which is like our biggest, most well put together T-Rex in the world was found in the Black Hills of South Dakota, mm. if you didn't know. But there's crazy drama like it was crazy uh, someone went to fucking jail over it like it's nuts mm -hmm. um so yeah if you're into dinosaurs or paleontology watch or drama or drama <laughs> like it's really good watch that documentary very much recommend dinosaur 13 yes okay, i think cool. it's 13 it's a teen it could be 18, but I think it's 13. <laughs> I love that we've reached the dinosaur segment of our show. Yeah. Uh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Dinosaur 13. It is. Yeah. Archaeology, paleontology. Good shit. Good shit. Bones. Do you like bones? <laughs> sure. I love Don't them. we all? Who liked Don't bones? We all. Right. Right. Don't we all? Right. So. Back to Roish. Uh, she, <laughs> she liked bones too. <laughs> she sure did. She was touching them seemingly often. Right. Um, so she got married when she was 29. She got married to another painter, uh, but she was already a successful artist and kept her maiden name. Uh, in 1699, Dope. she became the first um, female member of the Hague's uh, Painter Society, and the Hague is a city in um, Holland. And sh her work sold for more money than Rembrandt. She was, yeah, she was selling. She was making more money than Rembrandt. Yeah. I do love Rembrandt. To be, yeah, to I be just fair. said fuck you to him, but I, you know, <laughs> you didn't mean it. <laughs> I didn't I do. Mean it. I do love me. Some I meant Rembrandt, it in principle, but, but I am. I do <laughs> oh, love that she is, was. Uh, she was. Yeah, she was making bank. That makes yeah. Me happy. She she was and she painted like well into her eighties. Um, wow. She had she had ten kids. Kept painting Holy the whole shit. fucking time. Uh, the Medici collected her work. She was a court painter for like the Prince of Bavaria for a while. Um, yeah. What her resume <laughs> yeah. on this? Show. Yeah. yeah. Um, her last, the what is believed to be her last painting, which is called "Roses and Tulips on a Marble Slab" in 1747. She signed it. She signed pretty much all of her works. Um, she signed it along with her age of 83. And she died several years later. And Thank I just you. think that's so cool and cute that she was 83 that. painting, signed her name, and was like, bitch, I'm 83. <laughs> <laughs> That's and I'm gonna be by the that way, all the time. If I'm if I make it to 83, everything's gonna be like, bitch, I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like grandma, yeah. no, don't call people. I bitch. love that. That's so good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and um that's that's Rachel Roish, and I just recommend anyone to just look up her work and zoom in and and travel travel those little landscapes of flowers, leaves, and critters. Totally. Pretend you're an Good. ant crawling across yeah, the canvas. That mm -hmm. bug Inspecting. that was on yeah. Ginny's yeah. mail earlier. Who knows where he went now? Yeah, Hopefully, he's, he's made his pants. way into a Rachel Roish painting. Before. I wish for that for that <laughs> bug as well. Yeah, he could do push-ups in her paintings. <laughs> now, oh my god, <laughs> like a fucking The Shining moment, and we zoom in to a Rachel yeah. Rice, and he's there. There he is. <laughs> he's been there all along. <laughs> he's been there all along. Oh. It's just been a weird, like, universe crossover moment. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I love that. Love that so much. Oh, Wow. So many great ladies. I yes. love these gals, man. I do too. Should we do a quick listener mail and yeah, wrap things up <laughs> and I let have Jeannie one. finally eat? <laughs> I'm gonna eat. <laughs> She's gonna eat that bug. I <laughs> I already did. <laughs> Just kidding. She got too hungry. <laughs> Bugs are very nutritious way of the future no, no, man no. we'll talk about it, it on another episode it is it's the future y'all so like it or not 
not email. <laughs> um, so I have an email pulled up. We just we were just talking about our girl Rachel Royce, and we got an email from Raquel. So ah, that seems cool. fitting. All right, Raquel. It's a Hi, fancier ladies. Rachel. Right. <laughs> Hi, ladies. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for making quarantine bearable. Love Aww. your podcast. I've learned so much from you guys. So happy we could bring anyone any type of solace in in the quarantine. For days. real. That is so kind. Um, I just heard the holiday kitsch episode and I felt like you were talking to me. I am so kitsch. In fact, that's kind of my profession. You mentioned who could possibly create those images you find on Christmas decorations. Well, me. Oh, my God. (laughs) My business consists of creating images to license to big box companies. The art licensing community is big. The images I create are not necessarily of my personal taste. The objective is, is not to look good and be pretty. It is to sell. That's why you may see ugly stuff at the stores. If they are there, it's because it sells. It took me a while to understand that most people don't have the same taste as I have. (laughs) From my experience, after drawing millions of traditional Uh Christmas art, yes, the friggin' vintage red truck, after a while, you cannot stand to see another Santa wearing red on a snowy scenery. That's when things start to get weird, and that's my favorite part. Christmas mermaid cats, Santa riding a dinosaur in outer space, you name it. (laughs) <laughs> my it. favorite kitschy mm-hmm. thing are those mm-hmm. embroidered tea towels from the 50s with images of dancing and singing spoons and teapots love them my Aww. grandma had a bunch back in the day and by the way inflatable christmas decoration is a huge thing here in quebec mm. um and then she said keep up your amazing work raquel so wow i remember that one so cute that's super cool that is so awesome i and i love that it's like now you know we're talking about christmas in june go back and listen to the holiday kitsch episode it was really fun to record i i think i blacked out near the end of that episode i did a i don't know why i was doing shots of tequila to talk about that like weird all the weird ornaments and bullshit but <laughs> it was also a long one it was just it was our it was our holiday celebration so we were right. just like going for it but also <laughs> at some point because um we have we have our thomas kincaid episode that we recorded it just hasn't come out yet because i wanted to space it out from holiday right. kitsch because there's yeah. so much discussion of basically holiday kitsch in that episode sure um, so we're just holding on to that one for you guys. Um, and it's honestly, it's good. It, but also Nat and I talked about this. Like, we might turn it into like a weird like series or like Thomas Kincaid files because we feel like we need to do an intro episode where we talk because we've all had weird moments mm-hmm. with like Thomas Kincaid like just popping into our lives. Like Ginny, you have a great story, but I don't want, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to do it yet. We'll talk about it. We should save it. 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 We have had like some weird cosmic Thomas Kincaid stuff. And then we ended up recording like a three hour episode on Thomas Mm -hmm. Kincaid. And then also I'm kind of obsessed (laughs) with like his daughter's artwork. So I'm like, maybe we could get her on the show. I don't know, but we might turn it into a series. Some like closer to, closer to holiday kitsch time. I think that like is what's going to happen with all of that. So um, we're not done with holiday kitsch. basically. No. <laughs> we, no. we think that Thomas Kincaid's ghost might be hanging out with us. <laughs> yeah, he might be here right now. You guys. He could like, be. He might. <laughs> Thanks for your email, Raquel. I'm Raquel, very interested in um, how the heck you got into that profession so you know let us know because uh i would love to have a job just making like crazy ornaments that people want to buy for christmas yeah exactly like i would just lean into it i would i would make the i could think weirdest really weird shit possibly imagine i feel like that'd be so fun christmas poops christmas (laughs) poop emoji (laughs) that exists it's gotta there it Um, is well all right Thank you, Raquel. We appreciate you. We're glad that you're enjoying the podcast. Thank you for writing in. 
anyone else would like to write in to tell us anything really like whatever you want if you just want someone to talk to our history base at gmail.com <laughs> we love you and appreciate you your emails give us life so yes comment. Y- yes please do also a great way to hang out with us talk to us spend time with us would be patreon patreon.com slash art history babes also you want to get on there now because oh my god we are going to be reading the da vinci code <laughs> it's happening it's happening i've it's never read it i'm thing. so excited i've never Either. read it it's this is my first time and i would like you to come on this journey with me the listener there will never so. be another first time for the three of us <laughs> It's and the then it's just going to be me like on I'm just going to be like unearthing like 15 year old me like just weird programming, I think, is what's going to happen. So <laughs> there might be cool. there might be emotions. There might be tears. Just there might have be. to come pay to find out. <laughs> So yes. come check that out um, on the Patreon, friends. It's going to be Patreon.com slash Art History Babes. Get signed up for a book club. We're going to read Da Vinci Code. We do Zooms and talk about it. We're also going to do like a movie night at the end and watch the movie. So it'll just be a fun time this fun. summer reading the Da Vinci Code. Also, there's lots of other stuff on Patreon. You know, you can get our bonus podcast episodes that we do every other month. You can get our bonus videos that we do every other month. Um, Discussion boards for every episode. There will be one. There will be a discussion board for this episode on Patreon. So lots of good stuff and it helps us continue to make this. So please consider checking out Patreon, patreon.com slash art history babes also if you are interested in intrigued by the intersection of art and sex onlyfans.com <laughs> slash art babes oh, it's a gosh. really fun time over there we are very uh free and open and talk about all sorts of stuff um but yes the focus is is a lot of episodes on just the intersection of art, art history and sex Lots of cool topics, lots of cool content. So onlyfans.com slash art babes, Instagram at art history babes podcast, uh, our book. Always check out our book, the Anna Start Dictionary. We wrote that. We wrote it. It's pretty cool. And thank you so much for listening to Bad Bitches of the Baroque. We love y'all. Be good or be bad. Perfect Perfect ending. (laughs) Bye. 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 Cool. Done. Woo. The art history.